welcome, uh, especially if it's your first time here. We do this every week, and it's open to anyone who can get here. So feel free, if you enjoyed this Bible study, to come back and let others know about it as well. And bring friends and visitors and co-workers and anybody else who wants a nice lunch and some okay teaching. <laughs> so, last week, <clears throat> we looked at Leviticus chapter 13. And Leviticus 13 is a long chapter, and we only got through about the first 45 verses or so. But it dealt with an issue <clears throat> that had to do with skin diseases. It had to do with uh, what, what made someone unclean in the ceremonial sense. And we talked about how sometimes it's translated as leprosy, but, but the symptoms in this are not leprosy like we think of, not Hansen's disease. Uh, this is more like things like psoriasis or uh, skin infections or like fungal, ringworm type stuff. Any of those diseases. And they were all characterized under this broad Hebrew term, sarat. So sarat was this, this way of talking about skin diseases. And <clears throat> sarat were not just human skin diseases, they could also be in any kind of skin um, or any kind of covering, as we're going to see, because we pick right up in chapter 13, verse 47, and this is where, if you have an English translation, it may gloss over this, you may miss it, but it's the same thing. It's the, I'm reading from the NIV, it says, if any clothing is contaminated with mildew, well, that word mildew is sarah. That's the same word. It's, 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 I mean, it can mean mildew, so it's not like the NIV is wrong, but it's the same word. So there's, there's skin diseases, and then there's skin diseases of clothing as well. So it's important, this whole section, this chapter, end of chapter 13, and all of chapter 14, is all talking about this, this thing, this, this sarat, this uh, growth or spreading or uh, this, this disease, and it's translated in different ways. But it goes on to say, if any clothing is contaminated with sara, mildew, any woolen or linen clothing, any woven or knitted material of linen or wool, any leather or anything made of leather, so in other words, any kind of covering that you would wear on your body, and if the contamination in the clothing or leather or woven or knitted material or any other leather article is greenish or reddish, it is a spreading sara'ah, or spreading mildew, and must be shown to the priest. The priest is to examine the sara'ah mildew and isolate the affected article for seven days, just like you do with the person. The person was suspected of a skin disease, they didn't just kick him out immediately and say you're unclean. They, they put him in quarantine for seven days to see if this thing spreads. On the seventh day, he's to examine it. If the mildew is spread in the clothing, or the woven or knitted material, or leather, whatever its use, it is a destructive sara'ah, destructive mildew. The article is unclean. He must burn up the clothing or the woven or knitted material of wool or linen or any other leather article that has the contamination in it because the mildew is destructive. The article must be burned up so it's consumed by fire. If it's a spreading, if this mildew, this sara'ah, this disease of the clothing, so to speak, isn't going away. But, verse 53, if when the priest examines it, the sarath is not spread in the clothing or the woven or knitted material or the leather article. He shall order that the contaminated article be washed. Then he needs to isolate it for another seven days. After the affected article has been washed, the priest is to examine it. If the mildew has not changed its appearance, even though it has not spread, it's unclean. Burn it with fire, whether the mildew has affected one side or the other. In other words, if it hasn't started to go away, if it hasn't started to recede, and it stayed the same, it is unclean. It is, uh, it needs to be destroyed. Um, verse 56, if when the priest examines it, the mildew is faded after the article has been washed, he is to tear the contaminated part out of the clothing or leather or woven or knitted material. But if it reappears in the clothing or the woven or knitted material or in the leather article, it is spreading. And whatever has the mildew must be burned with fire. The clothing or the woven or knitted material or any other leather article that has been washed and is rid of the mildew must be washed again and it will be clean. So two washings, two washings take place, separated by the seven day period and then they'll be clean. These are the regulations and literally that says this is the Torah concerning contamination by sarat in woolen or linen clothing, woven or knitted material or any leather article for pronouncing them clean or unclean. Now there's 
on a lot of levels there's things going on, but there's echoes of Genesis in this because after uh, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, after they contaminated, were contaminated by sinfulness and driven from God's presence, uh, the very next thing that's mentioned is how God covered them. Their clothing, said so he made them garments of skin and he covered them. So keeping that Genesis theme, it only uh, makes sense that that would be what's mentioned here now is, is this clothing. So there's resonances, there's echoes of Genesis. But more importantly, this is speaking of um, the idea that, that, that this contamination is not, like we talked about last week, it's not like it's a one-to-one -one God's punishment for sin. All right, clothes don't sin. Leather doesn't sin. Linen garment doesn't sin. This is still, this is instilling in people the ritual, visual worldview, the, the, the theological picture of God and holiness and cleanliness and purity and all of these things that we've been talking about these weeks in Leviticus. It's reinforcing it at, at the, the personal level, even down to what clothes you wear. Now, yeah, are there safety concerns? Are there health concerns? Sure, you don't want mildew and diseased clothing that can contaminate and spread and all of that. You want to make sure that people aren't going around bearing disease. We, if you want to see what happens when that, when health concerns aren't put into place, look at Europe during the bubonic plague, you know, where things, disease was just carried around rampantly and people died and they had no idea why. So is there an element of that in going on Leviticus? Well, yeah, it would have helped prevent that. A lot of this makes sense from a hygiene perspective, but the main point of it is not hygiene. The main point of it is this, this even greater concept of the clean and the unclean, of the contamination and the spreading of uncleanness, the spreading of impurity, and its ability to, to like yeast, to work itself all through whatever it comes in contact with. Remember, yeast is a symbol for the permeation of uncleanness throughout Leviticus. And so it's that same concept, is just is teaching them that, that, that impurity has the ability to spread. And so drastic measures are to be taken for impurity, and even down to the level of your garments. But again, the New Testament will bring this out in effect uh, when it talks about the need for, uh, for cleanliness and, and, and purity in the moral sense. And how as, as ruthless as, as God commanded Israel to be in dealing with these infections or these disease, uh, God wants his people in the new covenant to be that diligent about making sure that they are rooting out or they are, are separating themselves from what contaminates spiritually and morally and ethically in our lives, in our own hearts, within all the way down to inside the person, rather than just trying to separate from other people. It's addressing the uncleanness even within your own sphere, your own uh, clothing, so to speak. But then it goes on, chapter 14, and it says, now, what do you do? So we've, we've looked at, okay, last week we looked at, well, this is how you tell if you're unclean. This is how you tell if they have these diseases. And this is what they're to do. They're to dwell outside the camp, and they can no longer be in God's presence. The whole concept is God's holiness and cleanliness and purity of the camp can't be compromised. So what do you do? It would be a pretty dull picture if there was no hope for restoration or redemption. But right here in chapter 14, we're going to see how one is restored after this uncleanness, after this sara'at, after this disease runs its course, after they are healed, either by God directly or through indirect means, there's this chance of redemption. There's this chance of coming back in when the disease has been dealt with, when the contamination has been dealt with. Then there's restoration. And even that in itself is a paradigm for all kinds of things, theologically speaking. But it's chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses, these are the regulations, or this is the Torah, for the diseased person at the time of his ceremonial, his ceremonial cleansing when he is brought to the priest. Verse 3, the priest is to go outside the camp and examine him. The person doesn't come back into the camp. The priest goes. The priest leaves the realm of holiness and goes into the realm of impurity, into the realm of, of uh, outside of his sacred space. There's the, 
the, the author of Hebrews will connect this to the ministry of Jesus, where he, in his atoning death on the cross, was crucified outside the camp. He went out to, metaphorically or theologically speaking, to the people he was redeeming, that he was cleansing, that he was bringing back into fellowship with God. So even in this, remember, everything in the Old Testament is, is, is hints and types and shadows of what's to come in the New Testament. And Jesus talks about being the fulfillment of Scripture. It doesn't mean he did certain things that were predicted. It means it all pointed to him. So in some way, you're going to hear echoes in the New Testament of these uh, concepts that are brought out in the Old Testament. So the priest is to go outside the camp examine it. If the person has been healed of his infectious skin disease, his sarah, the priest shall order that two live birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. And that word fresh water means not like not salt water. It means water from a living source. It's, it's, it's flowing water, a water that's come from a spring or a cistern. Remember we saw that that was the source of cleanliness a few chapters ago? Water in a spring, water in a cistern, it's not contaminated. So they're gonna bring some of that water, some clean, some pure, some cleansing water. Two birds, one is to be killed over this pot with this water in it. Uh, he is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yard, and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the infectious disease and pronounce him clean. Then he's to release the live bird in the open fields. So this, what's going on with, with, with hyssop and scarlet yarn and cedar wood? Well, when you read that, the way it reads in English, you think just a bunch of stuff, like some wood and some, some yarn, and you just throw it all in the pot. <laughs> but just think about it. It's, it's a brush. That's what it is. The handle is the cedar wood. The hyssop is a spongy, brushy material. It's a, it's a, they don't know exactly which type of it. There's some different varieties. But it, it's, it's, think of like a sea sponge or something similar to that. It's a spongy material. And you fasten it to the cedar with the yarn, tie it up, and you've got a brush. And you dip that into this mixture of the water and the blood from the live bird, from the bird that was sacrificed. You dip that in there. And then you can sprinkle it on the person. It can absorb the material and it can serve as a sprinkler, as a splatter brush. So think about it that way instead of just being random stuff being thrown in the pot, because that's the image that's being used. Um, and so you, the live bird then also, the live bird is dipped into this mixture and the live bird is released out into the, the back to where it came from. So these are to be uh, live birds, wild birds, not domesticated, not pets, not parts of the flocks or herds. These are wild animals. One is killed, one dies, one bears the impurity, the uncleanness, the whole ceremonial cleansing of the person on his body and carries it away out of the camp, out into the wild. There's, there's, uh, you'll see this in two chapters when you get to the Day of Atonement and Yom Kippur. This is the same thing is done, but it's done with the, uh, two goats. And one is bears the sins of the people, and then one is released out to carry their sins away. So that's the resonances that would be going on in the minds of people watching or undergoing this ceremony. And then uh, the person is pronounced clean by the priest. Uh, there's also echoes, again, not surprisingly, more echoes of Genesis. After the, the kicked out of the garden, after they were driven away, what comes later? Or, What's the next big account in the Genesis story? What the Noah gift and the cleansing of the earth through the washing of the water and two birds being released and one not coming back. You know? So there's echoes of the Genesis accounts woven into this ceremony in Leviticus that has other echoes, forward echoes of the Yom Kippur account. So there's all of these resonances. Listen, reading Leviticus, it's not something you just read it and go through like another, like other books in the Bible, like the Epistle or something, and you go through and you're like, oh, I get that, that makes sense, let's move on. You come back to it, you meditate on it. This is why the Psalms talk about, I meditate on your law day and night, and there's wisdom in there. You meditate on it, you read on it, you see the connection, you hear the resonance. It's like listening to a symphony. You don't just listen to a symphony one time and go, that was great, and never listen to it again. 
you listen to it again and you start to pick up resonances. You start to say, oh, this movement's coming up and I know that this movement is gonna sound like a movement at the end because they're connecting it. It's this work of art. And that's what Leviticus is. It's this literary work of art in addition to just being laws. There's artistry here. There's resonances, there's imagery, there's analogies. And that's how Leviticus works. The world of Leviticus is a world of analogies. God didn't teach them by giving them 21st century North American propositional truths. He didn't teach them through reasoning with them on an intellectual level of how this works for this and this works for this and this and this and this. Instead, he gives them these rolling waves of images, these, these ceremonies, these acts, these things that they have to do tangibly that would be teaching them lessons that would be forgotten or glossed over if they were just given as uh, philosophical principles. But instead, through the repetition of these acts that have deep symbolic meaning, the people are taught daily. Every time this happens, they are taught something visually, tactile, uh, you know, even aromatically, you know, the smells and the feel uh, uh, of what's going on. So all of this world is world you have to enter into. Then you can start to pull out and start to see the strands of the theological uh, tapestry that are being woven. So it's a very symbolic world. Now some of us, I was an art major, so this kind of stuff makes sense. You know, this world of visuals and of, of not just linear truth, but, but a whole realm of illusions and symbols and all that. But if you're an engineer, this may be like, just tell me the point, get to the point, what's going on? You know, if you're a, a grammar teacher, you're just like, okay, but what comes next? Give me the right order of things. But that's not how Leviticus works. It's not what God's given his people through their laws. So that's why it's a misnomer to think of Leviticus as just law, law, law. Yeah, there, these are laws, these are rules, but they are making a bigger picture. They are creating a world of microcosms. We've already talked about this. The tabernacle is a microcosm of Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was a, itself a microcosm of the universe with God at the throne and then gradations of holiness extending outward and the ability of humanity to approach him in these uh, levels of holiness or these degrees of holiness depending on their calling and their ability or their having been sanctified by him. So then what that is, then we see that in the tabernacle. That's what the tabernacle is. Only it's on a, um, a concentric scale of a tent with inner meet, uh, room and then an inner room rather than a vertical scale like a mountain. But it's the same thing. Take Mount Sinai and just flatten it, right? And you've got the tabernacle, basically. And that's the analogy that's used then for the human body, for the people, for their very presence is going to be this tabernacle structuring so that the outer is the realm of where anybody can have access. Anybody can have access to your body, whether you like it or not. Anybody can have access to your outer physical being. But when you move in a way, your soul, the, 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 the relationship, the relational part of you, the part of you that has a connection with someone else, that's then not as many people have access to that. Only the people you choose, the people that get to know you. There's that, that soul level of relationship, the emotional and the intellectual. And then within that, in the deepest parts of who you are, is the spirit, the holy of holies, where God himself dwells within your midst. And only you and only God have access to that. And so that's why scripture can say, you yourselves are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and bodies are a microcosm of the tabernacle, which is a microcosm of creation. So there's these levels of connection that Leviticus is painting, and I'm throwing them all out here because I want you, more than just knowing what comes next in this ritual, I'm wanting us to see the world that it's painting for us and that's setting up because then will the payoff will come when you start to see the relationships. For instance, the relationship for cleansing a person will have elements of new birth. There will be washing, there will be shaving off all of their body hair completely like a newborn baby coming out of the womb clean, shaven, slick, smooth, ready to re-enter re into life in the community. 
So there'll be elements of that, but then there'll be elements of when the priests were consecrated. Remember, back in Leviticus earlier, when he was going to consecrate the priest, they took the blood from the sacrifice. They put it on the priest's right earlobe, on his right thumb, on his right big toe, as a way of saying, you're being consecrated, you're being dedicated to the service of God completely. And so what you hear will be the obedience, and then you'll hear the word of God. And then what you do, your right thumb, which is symbolic of your, your, your ability to do stuff, your that will be dedicated to God. And your right big toe, the, where you go, where you walk, will be in the ways of God. So all this symbolism for the priest, well, lo and behold, in this very section, when the person is cleansed from their skin disease and brought back into the community, the, the oil from this ceremony is going to be dabbed in their right ear, on their right thumb, and on their right big toe. So like the priests, they are being called, not exactly because it's not the blood of sacrifices, it's this mixture of oil. But in a symbolic way, the priests, the people who are being brought back into relationship with God are being sanctified and consecrated as priests. Because that was the calling of God for his people in Israel anyway. I will make you a kingdom of priests. You will be a holy nation. So it makes perfect sense in the world of Leviticus that when you're restored back into this community, there's a restoration of your priestly calling as one who's been cleansed and been brought back into fellowship. So that's what all is kind of going on in these rituals. Uh, we'll buzz through this chapter and then we'll finish it up. It says, the person to be, all right, so after the thing is done with the birds and the birds are released, verse eight, the person to be cleansed must wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, bathe with water. Then he will be ceremonially clean. He's already been cleansed of the disease. None of this is how you get cured of the disease. This is not a medical text. There's nothing in Leviticus about how you get cured. This is for after you are cured. The, after this, he may come into the camp, but he must stay outside his tent for seven days. There's a question about whether that's come into the camp and stay outside of the person's tent or come into the camp and stay outside of capital H, his tent, meaning the tabernacle. There's some debate there. Take the choice, doesn't really matter. Uh, on the seventh day, he must shave off all his hair. So again, the, the shaving, the, the, the re, um, the physically getting rid of every aspect of the impurity that affected the outward skin, hair, clothing, whatever. He must shave off all his hair. He must shave his head, his beard, his eyebrows, and the rest of his hair. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and he will be clean. On the eighth day, he must bring two male lambs, one ewe lamb, a year old each, without defect, along with three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, and one log of oil for, or yet yeah, one log of oil. Log is just a term of measurement for oil. It's a couple of, it's like a, it's a fraction of time. It's not log, like you get a log and fill it with oil. It's just the, the Hebrew word for measuring the log. The priest who pronounces him clean shall present both the one to be cleansed and his offerings before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So he goes and brings these offerings that we've read about in early chapters of Leviticus. He's, he's restoring, he's entering back into the covenant community. Being part of the covenant community means worshiping in the tabernacle through the giving of these gifts and these sacrifices, including these, grain offering, fellowship offering, this is, this, we talked about it earlier, uh, weeks ago, this is the Hebrew Thanksgiving, this is that celebration, these are celebratory offerings as well as uh, atonement offerings. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guild offering, along with the log of oil. He shall wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. Remember, that's where you wave it, you give it to God, and then he symbolically gives it back to you. Waving is you giving and then God giving it back to you because it's going to be eaten by the people celebrating this. He's to slaughter the lamb in the holy place where the sin offering, burnt offering are slaughtered. Like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It's most holy. The priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering, put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall then take some of the log of oil, pour it in the palm of his own left hand, dip his right forefinger into the oil in his palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. The priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm on the lobe of the right ear, the one to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. 
the rest of the oil in his palm, the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed and make atonement for him before the Lord. Then the priest is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. After that, the priest shall slaughter the bird offering and offer it on the altar together with the grain offering and make atonement for him and he will be clean. So this is the celebration, ceremony, restitution, re-entering into God's people of the one who had been excluded because of their uncleanness, their disease, their sarah. This is the restoration of that person. Why do they have to offer, offer all these sacrifices? If the, if, if the disease itself is not evidence of sin, which we've talked about, it's not. And the whole book of Job is a treatise on that fact. Then why do they have to offer a sin offering or a guilt offering? Well, remember the sin offering is the unintentional sin offering in the Old Testament. We talked about that in the first couple of weeks. If you missed it, go back and watch the video. The sin offering is not for sins you, you committed intentionally. It's for the sins that you accidentally uh, committed, including becoming unclean. So it is, the, it is the restitution. It is the making right. It is, some translations say, the purification offering. And that's a better idea of what brings it out. It's the purification for the contamination that you have experienced and have been dwelling outside the cleanliness or the cleanness, symbolically speaking, of the camp of Israel. So it's this whole notion, and again, it's not just about contamination or contagion in a physical sense, but it's not just about a moral notion of sin and unholiness. It's this amalgamation of all of these things together. It's this whole world of symbols where, whereby God is teaching his people the ultimate lesson, which is he is the source of all cleanliness, purity, holiness, and life. And anything that would impinge upon that cleanliness, holiness, uh, uh, you know, anything that would symbolize death or decay is unclean, is not in his presence. And those two don't mix. There's this whole layers of buffering zone to keep those two things from mixing. And all of this is for the purpose of teaching God's people, illustrating through them, so that they can be an example to the watching world. The whole point of this takes us back to Genesis 15. Some of you were here two and a half years ago, three years ago, when we did Genesis 15. And you remember, God said, through your offspring, Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All of this ritual, all of the, the acts that Leviticus commands God's people to do, all of them are missional at their core. They are all for the purpose of showing and teaching the nations about who this God of creation is. Who is this Yahweh? I don't know him as Pharaoh's words. Pharaoh learned. And so through the Israel's interaction with this God, through their interaction, through their worship, through their covenant obedience to Yahweh, the nations will see, and the nations, hopefully, the plan is, if Israel remains obedient to all this, then the nations will be drawn to this God. And get a glimpse of it, get a tiny glimpse of it during the reigns of David and Solomon. But because of Israel's disobedience, including Solomon's, uh, that, that destiny is completely derailed for a long period of time until one comes in the new covenant who's destiny is to bring Israel back to its destiny. Turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. To bless the nations. And that's who John the Baptist starts his gospel with. The gospels start off with John the Baptist announcing Jesus getting things back on track. So, uh, let's just finish out this one section. Um, what do you do if you can't afford those sac sacrifices? What do you do if you can't bring a goat or a male or a lamb, two lambs a year old? Well, if you've been living outside the camp because of your skin disease, then you probably aren't wealthy unless you had a whole family of wealth or you have people taking care of you. You might very well be poor. What do you do? Well, uh, if, however, verse 21, he is poor and cannot afford these, he must take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be weighed to make atonement for him together with a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, a load of oil, and two doves or young pigeons, which he can afford. One for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. On the eighth day, he must bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. The priest is to take the lamb for the guilt offering, together with the loaf of oil, wave them before the Lord as a wave offering, same as before. 
he shall slaughter the lamb for the guilt offering and take some of its blood, put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, same as before. The priest is to pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand, and with his right forefinger sprinkle some of the oil from his palm seven times before the Lord, same as before. Some of the oil in his palm he's to put on the same place as he put the blood of the guilt offering, and the lobe of the right ear, the one to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot. The rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. Then he shall sacrifice the doves or the young pigeons, which the person can't afford. One is a sin offering, the other is a burnt offering, together with the grain offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. This is the Torah for anyone who has an infectious skin disease, Sarah, and who cannot afford the regular offerings for his cleansing. So there's restoration in the midst of this uh, section dealing with uncleanness or impurity. But we're not done yet. Because next week we're going to see it's not just impurity. You can't just get Sarah in your skin and your clothing. Sarah can also be found in your house, in your, in your actual home, can be infected by this. What do you do then? And what does that have to say about this whole relationship uh, of analogies? And, and, and the body is the temple, is the house, is the family, and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but we got to go because it's one on the dot. <laughs> so have a great week. If you want some seconds, we've got plenty left. And we'll see you next week. Thanks.